Welcome to the British Home Front in the First World War. This series was recorded at the University of St Andrews in June 2018 to accompany a conference marking the contribution by the peoples of the British Isles to the national war effort. In this set of podcasts, we look at the impact of the war on society and family life. We hear now from Dr Jonathan Boff about how Britain financed the war. My name is Jonathan Boff. I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Birmingham, where I teach history and war studies. Today I'm going to be looking at war finance, and in particular how the government used financial markets during the First World War, both in terms of controlling existing markets, the private sector, and also raising the money that it needed to fund its own war effort. John Maynard Keynes is a fascinating character, one of the central figures of the first half of the 20th century for British history, and someone who had a huge impact on the way that we remember the First World War. His pamphlet, The Economic Consequences of the Peace, which came out in 1919, as a result of his disillusionment with the policy of the Lloyd George government, really set the tone for how we think about the economics of the First World War full stop. And of course, during the 1920s and 1930s, his ideas developed about how the state can operate within the economy using deficit financing to keep the economy moving in times of recession in ways which he then put into practice working in the Treasury in the Second World War and in ways, in fact, which then dominated politics and economics for the next 30 years in the UK until Mrs Thatcher came along, really. So he's a very important character in how we perceived the First World War, and he was also important at the time, too, as a brilliant young man. He was plucked out from King's College, Cambridge, where he was a don, and put into the Treasury in 1915 to help advise on some of these issues. One of the reasons why John Maynard Keynes is such an interesting character is because he is intimately connected with a whole range of people across British society. Before the war, and indeed during the First World War, he's best friends with the whole Bloomsbury set, for example. He's very good friends with Virginia Woolf and her husband, and with many of the other thinkers and writers that congregated in that set. So he brings an artistic sensibility if you like, into the First World War. Before the First World War, he spends a short time as a civil servant. Then he goes to King's College, Cambridge, where he becomes a don and starts teaching economics. And at the outbreak of the First World War, gets called in to advise the Treasury. He's part of the delegation that is sent off to discuss the peace after the war at Versailles, but he's disgusted by what he sees as the betrayal of liberal ideals by Lloyd George and Clemenceau, at the peace conference, and in response writes this book, The Economic Consequences of the Peace, which tries to argue that the peace that is being imposed on Germany is a Carthaginian peace, which is only going to cause trouble for the future. And of course, many people have taken that to be prophetic. The other bit that is interesting about that book is that he starts it off by describing Britain before the war. And I think many of us Downton Abbey being a recent example, have this vision of Britain before 1914 as this sort of golden age of one eternal garden party, if you like. And and a lot of that is actually down to this fantastic depiction that he puts in The Economic Consequences of the Peace, which is precisely that kind of picture about what a wonderful, beautiful place it was, shattered by the First World War. And so in that way as well, I think he's very influential about the way we tend to look at the pre-war period and then the consequences of the war. There are three areas that I think that one has to look at the involvement of the state in finance during the First World War. The first is the way that it operates in and regulates markets. The second one is how it spends money. And the third one is how it raises that money in the first place. And what I'm trying to get at with all of this is the extent to which people start to move away from an Edwardian ideal and Victorian ideas of laissez-faire and free trade and the gold standard and government not being involved at all through to the kind of modern ideas that we have today about what the functions of the state are supposed to be. That's the real purpose. If we start off with that first area, the regulation of markets, there's a huge financial crisis even before the war breaks out, in fact, right at the end of July 1914, because people are worried about the danger of war, they start hoarding cash, 
across Europe, not just in Britain. They won't pay their bills. It causes a crisis of confidence. And it's a sort of 2008-style financial crisis in the making. Straight away, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, at the time David Lloyd George, calls in the Bank of England and some of the leading city bankers and personalities for finance, and including Keynes, they sit down and work out a plan to prevent economic disaster, rather as Alistair Darling and co. tried to do in 2008. So they suspend the banks. The banks are all told to take a week's holiday, so you can't get any money out. Then they print a lot of money. They recapitalize the banks by buying assets off the banks, which the banks are unable to sell because the markets have all dried up. It's huge state intervention, almost on a 2008 scale. The only real difference between 1914 and 2008 is that the government in 1914 doesn't buy the stakes in the companies themselves. The taxpayer bought a huge slug of RBS, for instance, and Lloyds Bank in 2008. Well, that doesn't happen in 1914. But otherwise, a lot of the techniques that are used in 2008 had been used in 1914. They also, at the same time, regulate the stock exchange, for example, and the money markets very tightly. London had been the largest financial market in the world by a long, long way, much greater in terms of its dominance then than it is now. If you wanted to borrow money internationally, you went to London at that time. Anyone who is foreign is no longer allowed to borrow money in London for the duration of the war. And even domestic institutions, companies, whatever, that want to borrow money have to demonstrate to the Treasury that it's in the national interest for them to be allowed to do so. So you have a very highly regulated financial system. It's liberalized a little bit later in the war. But there's a huge amount of state intervention in an unprecedented way. But what's interesting about it is that everyone assumes that's what's going to happen, that everyone looks to the government. So the idea that people didn't think the state should be doing this kind of stuff before 1914 doesn't really stand up that particular area. The second area that you see the government operating in financially is spending money. Before the war, the British government didn't spend a huge amount of money. Really, almost the only thing that the British government did before 1914 was provide defence. So it had a navy, it had an army, and that was kind of it. The Lloyd George and Asquith government, just before the First World War, had started to introduce old age pensions, for example, but still the level of state involvement in the economy was very small. Of the total national income of Britain, the UK government was spending about 7.5% only in 1913, 1914. During the war, because of the pressure to buy kit, employ, half the population, all these sorts of things, that figure rises to 45%, which is much more like the kind of level that we expect the state today. These days, the government generally spends about 40% of GDP, another word for national income in this case. This is a huge increase on anything that the government has ever done before. Even during the Napoleonic Wars, which go on for 22 years, the government never spends more than about a quarter of national income. So the government becomes the biggest customer of everybody. And indeed, they actually take over whole markets. So by the end of the war, the Ministry of Food has a monopoly of 85% of all the food manufacture, production, supply in the whole country. So the private trade in lamb, for example, evaporates. There isn't any because the government controls it all. Just up the road from St. Andrews in Dundee was the centre of the jute industry in 1914. Jute is the cloth which is made from plants in what is now Bangladesh, At the time, it was grown in Bangladesh, effectively, shipped to Calcutta, exported from Calcutta to Dundee, where it was woven and made into sandbags, and then shipped to Liverpool, where all the merchants who dealt in this kind of stuff were operating. The government needed to buy a lot of jute because it needed to buy a lot of sandbags to put in the trenches, and ended up buying over a billion sandbags over the course of the war. The jute merchants weren't stupid, could see this was going to happen, so started ramping their prices up, And one particular jute merchant tried to buy the whole supply so that then he could force the government to pay whatever he insisted on. But the government wasn't having any of that. So they just nationalized the jute supply, basically, took over the whole industry. They set the price that the jute grower got in Bengal, that the wholesaler got in Calcutta, that the spinners got in Dundee, all the way through to the sandbag that they then buy to put in the trenches. So they have a huge amount of control over large swathes of industry. The third area is raising the money for the war. 
The war cost somewhere in the area of six or seven billion pounds, which doesn't sound like very much today, but you can probably multiply that by about 200 times. So we're talking trillions of pounds in modern terms. Obviously, governments can either tax or they can borrow. In the First World War, they end up having to do both. So they increase taxation a lot. If you were a taxpayer in 1914, you end up paying between two and six times the amount of tax by 1918 that you were at the beginning of the war. And more to the point, the tax base in 1914 was very small. There were only about a million people paid income tax in 1914. They increased the tax base to three and a half million. So there's another two and a half million people who are paying tax for the first time, including wage earning, paid every Friday, manual workers. In the big scheme of things, there's not really much complaint about this. People are prepared to pay that tax. I think it tells you something about the amount of support there is for the war. They put duties up as well. So a gallon of beer, the, the duty used to be seven shillings and sixpence. They put it up to 70 shillings over the course of the war. And it was watered down. So if you liked your beer, you're in trouble. But if you can't raise the money from taxation of one form or another, obviously you have to borrow it. And so the vast majority, about three quarters of all that six to seven billion pounds, they end up borrowing. Most of it domestically. Some of it by printing money and the banks buying government bonds or bills. A lot of it, however, by getting small individual savers to give their savings. People will have seen pictures of tanks, what they call the tank bank. They'd park it in the middle of Glasgow and use it as a promotional tool to get people to come and give their savings to support the war effort. So again, before the war, about 345,000 different people owned UK government bonds, government securities. By the end of the war, it's 16 million, which again, I think tells you something very interesting about the level of support for the war effort. So about 80% of the money that is borrowed is borrowed domestically from small savers or from the banks. They have to buy a lot of stuff from America, and that's a much bigger problem for them. The Americans are hard-headed. They'll lend money, but it has to be on their terms, understandably. They start off borrowing from American banks, particularly J.P. Morgan, their agent and the biggest American bank that they work with. But as the war goes on, the amounts of money are getting so much bigger that it gets harder and harder to borrow those dollars. And eventually they have to go cap in hand to the American government and say, will you just lend us this money, please? And they will because by this stage, America is in the war. So the political ambitions and objectives of the US and the UK are aligned, and therefore the government is prepared to lend the money. What we find is during the 1920s and 1930s, ideas about economics and about government change. Employment never really recovers during the interwar period. It never goes below 10% between the wars. And the problem of how to solve unemployment is the problem that economists are grappling with throughout the 1920s and 1930s. And Keynes is in the forefront of this. He's a politically committed economist, and he realizes that old ideas, including ideas that he had previously held, that markets would eventually solve everything, and that the cure for unemployment was lower wages, just wasn't working. But wages were going down and down and down, and still unemployment was 10% or higher throughout the Depression, for example. So what he increasingly comes to believe is that sometimes governments have got to step in to unblock these markets when they become sticky. And in 1936, he writes his famous book, The General Theory of Employment, etc., which enshrines these ideas. So that by the time the Second World War comes along, he has created a theoretical framework within which the state has a proper role within the economy. So part of my argument in this whole discussion is that although the First World War is important in breaking down Victorian and Edwardian ideas of laissez-faire individualism, you also need some other things to happen as well. And in fact, those things happen after the war, during the 20s and 30s, as a result of the economic problems that go on then. At the beginning of the Second World War, John Maynard Keynes is pulled back into government to work on the economy and the financing of the Second World War. He's friends with and works at times with William Beveridge, who ends up writing the report which provides the foundation for the National Health Service. And he puts into operation a lot of the tools that they had used in the First World War again, but he refines them, he changes them, and in particular, he manages to find ways to finance the British war effort more efficiently, as he sees it, creating less inflation than he managed to do in the First World War. 
doesn't mean that Britain doesn't end the Second World War bankrupt. <laughs> They're still in debt to America to a huge extent, but luckily America has changed by the Second World War and is prepared to take a leadership role and to be generous with things like the Marshall Plan in a way that she was not in 1918. And therefore, the stage was set for 20, 25 years of general prosperity and consensus in the Western world, rather than 20 years of economic depression and struggle, as it happened in the 20 years after 1918. That was Dr Jonathan Boff on how Britain financed the war. You have been listening to the British Home Front in the First World War. The podcast series was made possible thanks to the generosity of John Cawthorne and the 1926 Foundation. The conference was supported by the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport and the Scottish Government. It was a Chrome Radio production for the University of St Andrews, with music by the pipes and drums of the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards. The producer was Katrina Oliphant, with sound design by Chris Sharp. The series editor was Professor Sir Hugh Strawn. In our next podcast, we hear from Professor Maggie Andrews about women and the family during the First World War.